research is not produced here for research sake, research is produced here to actually change the lives of the most marginalised in society. And so we address what we do, our researches, our analysis, to the movement, to the justice movement. Knowledge production does not just come out of the academy. Um, it's not just the theoreticians in the academy. Ordinary people in struggle produce a huge amount of knowledge and a huge amount of theory. We're an anti-racist educational charity and really we provide an analysis of structural racism in the UK and across Europe too, but also internationally with our journal Race and Class. We're, we're concerned about policy, about what the policy makers do. We are not convinced that the way to do something about that is to address the policy makers, uh, to attach ourselves to the agendas of policy makers. We attach ourselves to the agendas of those who are making struggle against existing unequal and unjust systems. One of the things that the IRR does is to not just look at policy top down, right? We're rooted in what the director of the IR, the former director of the IR, Sivan Anden, used to call the communities of resistance, right? Those are the communities in Britain, but also beyond Britain, which in a sense drive the Institute's analysis and also drive its policy formation. So it's a kind of bottom up way of of doing, uh, being an anti-racist think tank. We firmly believe in a practical politics. Uh, we don't want to be pie in the sky. We don't want uh, our theories to become so highfalutin that we don't care about what's happening to ordinary people on a day-to-day -day level. That's been the institute tradition, it's been the race and class tradition to always be linked to a transformative politics. So I think we have to put the institute back into its historical context, which was 50 years ago, it essentially rejected doing objective race relations and put people and communities, specifically black communities, their needs, their desires, um, their politics at the centre of what is not only kind of analysis of racism, but also policy formation and, and politics. Well, the Institute had a very chequered history. It was set up in 1956 um, to look at, quote, race relations in the countries that were getting independence from Britain, which had been the colonial power. It was set up to study the relations between races in an objective, scientific manner. And at the time that it was set up, it was in the early 50s, this applied to the new emerging nations of the world, the third world countries. But uh, essentially, to case the joint, so to speak, of the newly emerging countries for the prospects of businesses. And it had on its board some of the biggest multinational capitalists in this country, the owners of big media conglomerates, people from the House of Lords, people from the Commons. This was the organisation of the establishment. And these members of the Council were the Lords of Humankind, Oppenheimer of South African Consolidated Gold Mines, um, Seaboom of Barclays Bank, DCNO, Michael Caine of Booker Brothers, who owned at one time half of then British Guiana. And the establishment was telling not just the staff, but through the staff telling the populace generally how to look at these newcomers. What created the rift which led to the changing of the Institute is that the world outside was changing massively. This is the end of the 60s. You had the Vietnam War, you had black power, which had a big influence on Britain. You had the beginning of the women's movement. You had movements for, for justice. Uh, movements over housing. It was a time of ferment. You also had police becoming very brutal and very clearly um, harassing black meeting places and young black people. So you had this reality which didn't meet with what we were being told to research at the Institute of Race Relations. It was a massive sort of gap. What I learned through the struggle at the Institute was that the problem wasn't black people but white people. The problem wasn't race relations as such, but racism, institutional racism, which was a white problem, that it was white society we should be researching and exposing. And we forced them 
to take the whole issue of the direction of the Institute to an extraordinary general meeting of the membership. But they hadn't realised that we had changed the membership significantly. So when we actually had this extraordinary general meeting, which was on the 18th of April 1972, and it was packed and it was picketed by black power activists and we'd organised all over the world. People were sending in sort of telegrams of support and so on and so forth. When they actually put the whole issue of how the institute was run to the, to the meeting, I think they were defeated something like 98 votes to six or something like that. So the whole governing board, which was some of the most powerful, mainly men in this country, then had to resign. At that point, we voted Siva in as the director of the Institute, and also he became the editor of the journal, which at that point it was a very academic thing called Race, and we changed it under him into Race and Class, a journal for black and third world liberation. So Race and Class is a quarterly journal. It's the more scholarly aspect of IRR and it covers racism, globalisation and empire and imperialism and it's a really crucial resource particularly for scholar activists in the university. What Race and Class has over the other journals, which the other journals essentially don't have, is that its audience and also the people who write within it aren't necessarily simply academics. They are reflecting those communities of resistance and the issues that kind of underpin British anti-racism or anti-imperialist struggle abroad and it brings this to a wider audience. So there are many journals but there is only one race and class. The journal could give a voice to people who didn't otherwise get into academic journals in this country but we did try and write for everybody. We tried to make articles accessible. We tried to be part, if you like, of what was being taught to students in the universities as well as a, a, a venue for the struggles themselves to speak. When I was an undergraduate, I, I read someone called Sivananda. Anyone interested in anti-racism has to essentially read the consciousness of, of British anti-racism, which is Sivananda. I don't care about whether a policeman is racist or an immigration officer is racist. Those things don't matter to me. I want the policeman punished if he's racist. I want the immigration officer's laws changed so that he doesn't examine my sister for her virginity when she comes into this country. Siva, like me, like myself, I think, is why we're brothers, was reared. His sense of agency uh, was forged in the furnace of colonialism. He was a, a colonial island boy, like me. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. He was from Sri Lanka. And that, beginning in, in anti-colonial, uh, awareness struggle never ceased to mark uh, his leadership. There was no overall overarching analysis of that combined all the campaigns and all the struggles that were being fought by black communities, so to speak, anti-racist struggles in this country, before Sivanandan produced a little essay from resistance to rebellion. And Sivanandan's writings um his four, his speeches, essentially gave me a grounding in what the Institute was doing, even though the Institute stretches beyond him, right? Today, it turns out, one of our key roles is that we are, in fact, educators of the movement. We now have uh, the most complete, I would suggest, uh, archive of black struggle in Britain, uh, uh, from, the, from, the, from the ground activist ground. Um, uh, so now and beyond, we become a source of the making of new knowledge. The IRR News is our news platform and we see it as an alternative media platform and it's our way with connecting to people and publishing our work and also amplifying the voices of those who write for us as well. We publish a newsletter every two weeks um, which is usually our way of providing an analysis of what's going on and we also publish the calendar of racism and resistance which is a really key part of our work that all of us are involved with including a whole wealth of volunteers as well and that is basically a roundup of the most important developments in racism and social justice issues in the UK and across Europe and we've actually now turned that into a database which is called the register of racism and resistance. Well, I think at the moment there's a kind of like collapse in politics we've found that lots of young people um, 
are becoming increasingly disillusioned with politics in this country and a way for them to channel some of their frustrations and to um, essentially get involved in what's happening in their local communities is to find out the grassroots campaigns and um, activist movements that are going on. And At the IRR we have a wealth of um, experience and history in the team of anti-racist struggles and I think IRR News is a really key place where we amplify those histories. When I came to the Institute in the early to mid 1970s, the activism on the street at the time was dominated by, if you like, the early realization that there was an assault on what we used to call black youth. Everywhere, up and down the country, the assault was, it was visceral. It was right there. Any black youth on the street will tell you that the major threat for them for all their lives in this country has been represented by the police, the blues, the men in uniform on the beat who humiliate them every day, who pick them up on sus, who take them out to the station, who beat them. They all have, you know, every, every one out of four black youths has a story to tell. The sus laws in the 1970s may seem very distant to us. But if you actually go back into local communities now and we start talking about the gangs matrix, the same issues have resonances with these same communities over the same decades. My research is for the multi-ethnic working class community that I grew up in. Um, so I wrote the London Clearances. Essentially what inspired the idea of the, the research for that was living through gentrification in my own community and I was particularly concerned about this idea that gentrification is a colorblind project and that it, it solely affects people based on their class. And we know that um, more black people live in social housing in London, so of course this is going to have a um, particularly hard effect on black people. But it's not just so much that people are moved out of or decanted from their housing, but there's a whole process that happens before that whereby people are targeted and life is made particularly hostile for um, certain communities. We know that young black working class people are targeted by the police. For my second report, I was interested in education and looking at the Prue to Prison pipeline, which a lot of concerned pupils, parents and teachers, community groups had been talking about for a while, this sort of criminalisation process that happens within schools and how some young people are funnelled from um, academies or, or some local authority schools into pupil referral units and then on to um, prisons. The thing that connects the two reports is interrogating the idea of the criminalisation of young black people which is something that the Institute has consistently researched. To take the incident of Child Q, the 15 year old girl in Hackney who was um, strip searched um, while menstruating um, in her school. This is just another example, the most abhorrent example actually that I've come across in a long time of the criminalisation um, of young black people and so the Institute's work really has sort of shifted, or it shifts its lens onto those most in need and so whilst we'll still be looking at the ways in which young black people are targeted on the streets via the police. We're also looking at the ways in which police infiltrate schools and target children. Look at the work that these two always done on what are now called deaths in custody, in particular black deaths in custody. We were one of the few people who've been looking at it, noting it, writing essays about it, uh, supporting marches on the streets about it down the years. We were, must have been, some of the first people to begin to dare to say that there's something fundamentally wrong with policing in our society. We were only articulating and gathering together what a lot of black groups already knew on the ground, but we were putting it in a, in a public discourse. So the work on policing was important and the other issue that we took up was the issue of anti-racist education. So people are now talking about decolonising the curriculum, but this was something we were trying to do from the 1980s. So we began to produce for young people booklets on racism, which we um, did in a cartoon format. But that cartoon book was so popular, and it was actually found in W.H. Smith's by one of the leaders of the what they call the New Right, the Tawny New Right, that it became absolutely no notorious and they tried to get them banned from schools, 
they tried to say that we had caused the riots um, in Broadwater Farm because we were so incendiary in the work we were doing. So I think the, the key battle for the IAR heading kind of next, the next kind of five years is, is around this authoritarianism around ideas of citizenship, around the return of the state. So in the contemporary moment, especially on the left, there's a, there's a certain idea that the state has returned, right? We had 30 to 40 years where the state was kind of absent. Again, those of us who, have, who work at the IRR would, would never really agree with that. But there's a return of the state, return of state spending, the idea that you can use the state to kind of do things. Our analysis is to show you that that's not going to be a neutral process. That's going to be a process of demarcation, of racialization, bordering, and of, of literally extermination. Look at what's happening with the Priti Patel's Rwanda policy. This hasn't come out of nowhere. The idea of outsourcing migration is a very old idea. So those kind of violences, A, have a history, and B, I think, will pivot what the Institute kind of does in its analysis moving forwards, which is, which is to stop these things. Now, in terms of the hard right at the centre of society, um, a growing authoritarianism in policy circles, um, the way that you know, after 1980s to today, when you had a discussion around race, you have the McPherson report, you have this notion that racism and institutional racism was a problem in society, all that is gone. But at the same time, there is definitely an uptick in the struggle. And what I find particularly refreshing at the moment is the growth in a national anti-racism. What's fantastic about the Institute now is we have some fantastic young people working with us now who have the same commitment that we had and are learning the traditions that have come through the Institute but are teaching us at the same time how to apply those traditions to the current situation which of course is changing all the time as we always say racism doesn't stand still nor does the way we fight racism. And one of the key mantras that's, that continues is this quote that the people we're writing for are the people that we're fighting for. And that's really key because it mean, it's, it's a way of ensuring that our work is always accessible. Um, it's always rooted and grounded in um, lived experiences and the realities of what is going on. It is one of the few places in, uh, in Britain, one of the few organisations making struggle against racism that has not forgotten that anti-racism is linked to anti-imperialism. The IRR has not forgotten that race and class are the battlegrounds. In many ways, the Institute has been the consciousness of a prior era, that link between anti-racism here and the struggles of the dispossessed abroad. And for 30 years, when these, when these ideas weren't in vogue, the Institute was the one of the few places still making these claims. What's fascinating is it's now become politically fashionable again to make these links. That the Institute stayed strong. It ran the course whilst others were doing other things, talking about uh, new ethnicities, new identities. The Institute stayed core to what it was and has been proven right actually in the last 30 to 40 years that it was right to stand its ground on the link between race and class.